Well, good morning. Welcome to our worship services today. This is the fourth Sunday of the season of Easter, so it is still appropriate to say Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and amen. Fourth Sunday of Easter is often known as Good Shepherd Sunday as well, so you'll see shepherding and sheep as a theme that runs through the entire service today, the readings, the hymns, and the sermon. And we thank Bev for playing today, for John and Tanner for taking care of things in the AV corner. Order of service, if you're going to use the hymnal, is page 151, or you can follow along on the screens. Also, we have a big happy Mother's Day uh, for all you ladies. We celebrate all ladies today, and uh, we wouldn't be here without our moms. Makes moms very important, and with the big Supreme Court leakage of the Roe v. Wade that has come out, no matter how it is argued, as Christians, we are always in favor of life, and abortion always tragically ends up ending a human life, no matter how you wish to argue it. So whatever the government decides is irrelevant, as Christians, we will practice our faith regardless. As far as other things, uh, we also have a youth outing to the Iowa Cubs game on May 20th. Information is in the bulletin on that. Vacation Bible School is also coming up. We are going to need volunteers for it because we're anticipating it to be larger as we keep coming out of COVID more and more. Fellowship area left-hand side is a paper sign-up sheet. There's also a sign-up genius link in the bulletin that you can click in the emailed version of and uh, sign up there. And if you cannot be here every day for Vacation Bible School, that is fine. Please indicate that, and we'll plug you in wherever we can. As far as other things, there's a large announcement in the bulletin on the church mailboxes. That's kind of a dying medium of conveying information, but if you're interested in still having one, check out that information in the bulletin, and uh, we'll get that taken care of. We also have the Mission Central sign up for July 9th being available today in the fellowship area. If you have not been to that little place outside of Mapleton, Iowa, it is well worth a trip. I encourage you to go and experience the largest mission supporting agency in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Uh, I think it was around $6 million maybe last year that was used to generate to support missions. Great museum there, Creation Museum is there, a much smaller scale than the Creation Museum that we have uh, in Ohio, but still a neat thing to experience nonetheless. We also have uh, the uh, ladies of our church, the Beautiful Women in Mission, local LWML chapter, sponsoring another in-gathering for the Orphan Grain Train. Information is in the bulletin on that. There are totes in the fellowship area where you can drop off those items for an undie and sock Sunday. Uh, I was moved today, so I took off my underwear and placed them in there already, so we're ready to go for that. No, no I didn't do that, of course. Uh, I also have a video on Camp Okaboji that our member, member Kendra Henningsen put together, so Tanner, go ahead and hit the next slide, Hi, please. Hi, my name is Kendra Henningsen, and I'm going to be talking to you about Camp Ogoveji. Why I love Camp Ogoveji so much is because you're never bored. For example, they have Nine Square, Gaga Ball, and even Archery. One of my favorite activities at Camp Ogoveji is definitely the lake. We get to swim in the lake for about 40 minutes. There are three rafts. Two of those rafts are for relaxing and this one is actually my favorite one because you sink. There are about three cabin activities where you're competing against other cabins. This one happens to be my favorite one. We had to lick pudding out of a bowl and we had to lick it clean. Other people happened to not be so lucky and they had to drink apple juice out of a baby bottle. But I don't really like pudding and so I just decided to smear it all over my face. Another one of the cabin contests are one of the final ones. This one we had to pass the ball over and under ourselves. And this one we also had to do a tug of war championship. We happened to beat the boys and we ended up winning. Can you not tell? Our cabin is split up into two sides. There's section A and there's section B. I was in section A. One of my least favorite things about Camp Okoboji is definitely cabin clean out. Every morning we had to clean out our cabin and Pastor Ken would have to come judge it. And um, whoever got the best score or whoever got the cleanest cabin got a house broom and you wanted that broom. We never won. Moving on, about every afternoon, after lunch, we'd have chapel. We'd spend about 40 minutes to an hour learning about Jesus. Also, every night we'd have devotion and we'd sing campfire songs and Pastor Ken would have a short little present presentation to understand a little bit more about Jesus. 
Also, there'd be a camp store when, where we can buy slushies, ice cream, and much more snacks from the camp. And there's also like t-shirts, blankets, and other accessory stuff. Also, every lunch was so good. We'd have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and it was all very good. We'd also get to choose our own drinks, like Hawaiian punch, lemonade, Pepsi, Sprite, like all those types of drinks. That's why I love Camp Okoboji's lunch. I hope that you get to experience Camp Okoboji. You'll find the registration link in today's bulletin. Okay, how many of you have been to Camp Okoboji before? Not necessarily as a participant, but just have been there before. Yeah, it's a great experience, and so uh, for kids and even family programs, it's time to start getting registered for that. There is financial aid available as well. Uh, so again, check the link in the bulletin, and that has information on it. Any other announcements anyone else wishes to make today? Yes, it'll be right after the first song at second service, so you just stay a little longer and you'll be out right away because you've already been here today. Anything else? If not, please stand up, share a good morning welcome with those around you. Please go out of your way and introduce yourself to someone you may not know.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our responsive psalm for today is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have wakened from death the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit that when we hear the voice of our shepherd, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading for the fourth Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 20, where the Apostle Paul says goodbye to the Ephesian elders. He spent a lot of time in Ephesus, wrote to them the letter of the Ephesians, and he will never see them again until they're in glory. Now from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading from Revelation 7 gives us a picture of heaven and the worship that goes on there. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our youth worker Kim White has her kids message for today. And Kim, I do have a microphone up here as well for you.
Good morning. All right, you guys sit down. Sit down too, Alex. Eve is going to show you something that I have today, but before I, she shows you what's in our box, I wonder if you guys could tell me what season it is. What do you think, Beatrice? It's the month of March. Do you know what, what season March is in? Spring, absolutely. Spring is a season where there's lots of new life coming forth, and we have some something that you might see in spring that shows new life in here. You can set it down, Eva. All right, go ahead. Pull it on out. Get it? Do you think you know what it is by what you hear? <laughs> this is wheat. And wheat is new to our house. We get new chicks almost every spring at our house. Now, chicks aren't the only new thing that comes in the spring. Can you guys think of any other new baby animals you've maybe seen lately? What have you seen, Beatrice? What? Right here? Oh, okay. Have you seen any new babies this spring? Bunnies. Yes, there's new baby bunnies around. I've seen some baby snakes. Anybody like those? <laughs> you do? Good for you, Anna. There's also not just new animals around. Have you noticed any other new life just bursting forth outside in nature? Notice anything green coming up out of the ground? What'd you say? Plants. Lots of plants. Yes, the grass, the flowers. Have you seen the trees? They don't look, there's not really leaves on them yet, but have you noticed the buds on them? So spring's pretty awesome because we see winter makes everything look so dead and brown and ugly after the pretty snow goes away. And then spring starts coming forth, and it's so awesome to see that new life like wheat. That makes me think of our new life in Christ. And I'm going to read to you a Bible verse from 2 Corinthians. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Did you guys hear me talk about how something old passed away there? Now, you're all not that old. How could something old pass away from you? Well, you see, a long, long time ago, God created the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve. And they're actually our great, 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 grandparents. All of us have the same great grandparents. And they gave us something from really long time ago. Sin. And that sin is what that Bible verse is talking about. How that old sin got washed away in your baptisms and the new has come. So now, just like wheat has new life on this earth, we have new life too. New life to not live, having to listen to our sin, but we get to have a new life in Jesus, a life forgiven because he died on the cross for us. All right, so when you come up this morning to get your treat, you can get a little closer look at wheat. I'm going to ask you not to touch her, though, because then I have to, have to ask you to go wash your hands. So go ahead and grab yourself a treat. Take a look at wheat as you walk by, and you can take a seat. And you all get candy jackpot today because of the generosity of one of our members. I think I want Chick-fil-A for lunch. <laughs> Please rise for our Alleluia and verse. according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In John 10, for today, Jesus will speak about who is and is not his sheep. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was talking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, 
How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our next hymn. reasons why Jesus performed miracles are number one, because they fulfilled Old Testament prophecy, and number two, because they provide evidence that Jesus is God. One example of Jesus' miracles fulfilling Old Testament prophecy comes from Isaiah chapter 35, written some seven centuries before Jesus was born, where Isaiah prophesies the following. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not, Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Jesus did all those things. He fulfilled that prophecy. He healed blind, deaf, lame, and mute people. And when he did so, it was a very strong indicator that perhaps he is the special agent of salvation that God promised to send into the world. In other words, when you see someone with the power and ability to those miracles, then you have found the promised Messiah, the one you have been looking for. And such works are not only a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, but are also works that only God can do. For who else besides God can heal blind people, deaf people, lame people, and mute people, usually just by telling them, you're now healed? Only God has that power with his spoken word. His same spoken word that brought the universe into existence out of nothing. And if he can bring the universe into existence out of nothing but the power of his spoken word, well, then he can certainly do lesser miracles of healing people by the power of his spoken word too. And by the way, when there are people who deny that God created the universe by the power of his spoken word, they still have to answer the question of 
well, where did everything come from then? Because we claim that all time, space, matter, and energy are creations of God. And since it has been scientifically demonstrated that the universe is not eternal, but that the universe actually has a beginning, a starting point, then we know that time, space, matter, and energy are not eternal. So that means that those who deny God created everything are forced to say that nothing created everything, which is a philosophical impossibility. It is also a scientific impossibility. However, a fairly recent theory to help explain the universe is that of the multiverse theory. It is a theory that gets God out of the equation. It says our universe is not the only one out there, but is just one in a series of infinite possible universes that are out there. And we just so happen to be in this one. We got lucky. It just so happens to put us in the right galaxy, in the right solar system, on just the right planet, where everything magically comes together just so in order to make life possible. But the biggest problem with the multiverse theory is that there is zero evidence to support it. It is a theory that has been put out there simply to try and get rid of God. Also, the multiverse theory, if it were true still does not answer the question of origin. Where did all those other infinite universes come from then? It simply kicks the can of origins further down the road, much like how our government's ever-increasing spending keeps kicking the repayment of our national debt further and further down the road. Now, not only does Jesus heal blind, lame, deaf, and mute people to help prove he is God, but he also performs many other miracles instead. He is able to read minds. Jesus is also able to control the weather, as evidenced by his calming of the storm. He is also able to defy the laws of physics by walking on water. Jesus is also able to manipulate molecules as evidenced by his changing of water into wine. And yet in John chapter 10 for today, Jesus is surrounded by people who do not believe in him or in his miracles. And they ask him point blank, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answers by saying, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. So Jesus has already told them that he is the Christ, the long-promised Messiah, the anointed one of God that they have been waiting for since Old Testament times, but they don't believe him. Jesus said so earlier in John chapter 8, for example, that he is the great I am. So then Jesus says here, hey, if you don't believe me, you don't want to take my word for it, just check out the miracles I've done. They provide evidence that I am who I say I am. But they still refuse to believe. And this is not the only time that Jesus points to his miracles or to the works that he has done as a way to prove he is God. In John 10, 37, Jesus said, Even though you do not believe me, believe the works. In John 14, 11, Jesus said, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. And then right after where our gospel reading for today ends, if you read just three verses further, we get this continued dialogue between those unbelieving Jews who surrounded them and Jesus. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. So the Jews will grant the fact that Jesus has done some very remarkable works, which indicate he is God, yet they want to kill him anyway because he has the audacity to actually claim to be God, which is so ironic because at the beginning of their discussion with Jesus, they demand that he tell them whether or not he is the Christ. And then two minutes later, when he does so, they try to kill him for it. But his death will not occur just yet. 
his death will occur on his own terms when he later dies on the cross for the forgiveness of all of our sins. And by the way, there are some people who ridiculously assert, well, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God himself. That was just something the church threw upon him in later years to make him divine. Well, sadly, people who make that assertion have not read their Bible because as we see here in John chapter 10, verse 33, the Jews fully understand Jesus just claimed to be God. And because of that blasphemy, that's why they are going to kill him. It is a capital offense. And it's also the reason why they crucified him. For blasphemy, because he claimed to be God. Now, of all of Jesus' works or miracles, some of the most convincing are when he raises people from the dead. He raised the widow of Nain's son from the dead. He raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He raised Lazarus from the dead. And of course, being raised again from the dead himself, just as he predicted, is his most convincing miracle or work of them all. For who else but God alone has such absolute power over both life and death? So why didn't those unbelieving Jews who surrounded Jesus that day in John 10 at least believe in him because of the evidence provided by his miracles? Well, Jesus answers that for us. He said, you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Ah, so the reason they failed to recognize Jesus is because they didn't want to make the decision to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of their life. No, that's not it. It's because they weren't God's sheep. You see, salvation is a mystery, and there are some Christians that think we have a totally free will and we can decide to do whatever we want to, even decide to be a Christian if we want. But no, becoming a Christian is not an act of our will. It is not based upon our decision to accept Christ. Our will is not totally free and neutral. It is enslaved in sin. Faith is a gift that God gives to his sheep. And why it is that some people believe and become God's sheep, while other people can be baptized and hear that exact same message of salvation and not believe and become one of God's sheep? Well, that's a mystery. We don't know why. All we know is that God has given us baptism and the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection as tools to gather in his sheep. It is not for us to know why it works on some, and not on others. So rather than give ourselves a migraine caused by pointless speculation, we Bible-believing Lutherans stick with what we know, with what God has revealed to us in the Bible. And what we know, what God has revealed to us, is that as his sheep, we have the blessing of being able to recognize Jesus' voice, as our good and noble shepherd, as the God who protects and saves us, as the God who loves us so much that he leads us through the valley of the shadow of death all the way into the greener pastures of heaven and beyond, all the way to our own bodily resurrection on the last day. And I love how the original Greek language the New Testament was written in when it says that Jesus gives us eternal life and that no one will ever snatch us out of his hand. It is what is called an emphatic denial. So it is as if Jesus says this. There is no way in hell anyone is ever going to snatch my sheep out of my hand. So as a professing, confessing Christian, Jesus has a hold of you, and he will never let you go. He will pull you through all the crud of this life and place you safely in his kingdom of glory for all eternity. He will not let you go. No one will snatch you out of his hand. So when things in life get dark or bleak, and you feel like you are failing or falling, Jesus still has you. He won't let you go. 
Why would he? He paid a tremendous price of his own life for you. You are eternally valuable to him. And to keep hearing Jesus' voice, well, you want to get into his word. Read and study the Bible. Get to worship. Receive Holy Communion. That's how faith in Jesus is given and strengthened. You don't need to worry about things on his end. He does not and will not waver, but we do. That's why you need to keep hearing his voice by getting into the word and by getting to worship. And as far as sheep hearing Jesus' voice and following him, Sheep in real life can actually recognize a human's voice and know who they can and cannot trust. I remember a bottle-fed lamb on the farm that I was particularly fond of, and I named him Whitey because he had a pure white face. And by the way, I was like 10 years old when I named him that, and it was a very long time ago, so it was not meant to be a racist name. Heaven forbid if you would have been a black-faced sheep, I wouldn't be able to tell the story today because the woke mob would cancel me. At any rate, after Whitey was weaned off of the bottle, I did not have a lot of regular contact with him. But I could still go up to the fence and call him. I'd say, Whitey! And he would hesitatingly leave the rest of the flock and approach me at the fence. And that is similar how it is when Jesus calls you. He calls us to leave everything behind and to come to him, to trust in him. And sometimes we hesitate to do so because it's real comfortable staying with the rest of the flock. But what is in our best interest is to ignore everyone and everything else around us and to have a singular focus on him, and to follow him no matter what. And why shouldn't we? He gives us eternal life. Because of him, we never perish. And he says that no one, no one, will snatch us out of his almighty hand. In his name, amen. We rise. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our Christian faith by reciting together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we pray. Jesus, great shepherd of the sheep, by means of word and sacrament, you and the Father send the Holy Spirit into our hearts to give us that free gift of faith, forgiveness of all of our sins, the promise of getting through this life and having life everlasting in the joys of paradise. Not only keep us in the faith, faith, but also empower us to be bold enough to share the good news of salvation with others so they too can be delivered. We also pray for those of difficulties of health, and we pray for healing and comfort. We pray for Joanne, Lisa, Dave, Lori, Betty, Randy, Lindsay, Don, Emily, Gail, Gary, Tony, Galen, Christine, Pete, Sammy, Will, Pat, Donna, Matt, David, Scott, and all of those who have issues we bring before you in our heart. And Lord of life, we thank you for using mothers to give us life. And we pray for all women who are ever in a situation of an unplanned pregnancy that you would give them resources and direction to choose life. And we pray that abortion would end in this nation. But help us to be reasonable and also understanding when we listen and discuss this topic. 
And we also pray that beautiful beginnings would keep giving great care to the kids and families of our community, that you would bless the Wolf family in Kenya and all other missionaries and church workers and Christians to be faithful to what you say in your word above all else. And we also thank you for Bryce, Alex, and others in the military who do what is necessary to protect the freedoms that we enjoy. And we pray that those freedoms would expand to all areas of the globe, especially in the Ukraine, so the war there can end. Guide all government leaders so they do everything according to how you would have it done. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When it comes to the collection of the offering, online giving available, envelopes can be dropped off in the basket in the back of church, as well as the little white cards in the pews. Please fill those out so we can acknowledge your presence here today. We continue with the offertory. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our final hymn. 